everyone. Welcome to Who's the Boss? It's a Star Wars podcast from laughingplace.com. My name is Mike Celestino. I am your host. I am the lead Southern California reporter and editorial director for Star Wars content at Laughing Place. This is episode number 126 of Who's the Bosk, and we will be talking about the eighth episode of the live-action Disney Plus series, Star Wars Andor, in addition to the new animated series of shorts called Star Wars Tales of the Jedi. And for that conversation, I have invited back on the show my fellow Laughing Place contributor, Bill Gausel. Bill, how are you? Thank you for coming back on the show to talk about Star Wars again. Well, thanks for having me back, Mike. Uh, doing quite well and looking forward to talking about this incredible show. I absolutely love Andor. So well, looking forward to chatting about it with you as well. Um, I thought about you last night because I had to watch and review the episode of The Masked Singer that featured the Muppets. Did you get, get a chance <laughs> I, to see that? I, I did not get a chance to see it. I was I was trying to catch or get ahead with uh, Alaska Daily for the recap for today. And uh, okay. which, by the way, I, I can't recommend enough. That show is fantastic. Uh, but I did I did catch the clips there online. And okay. I, I love seeing the Muppets, seeing them get out there. Yeah, it seems I don't like care any been, form. Been in the zeitgeist lately, which is always yeah. good to see. I don't I don't think Mass Singer is really my kind of show. No, fun, not mine either. <laughs> fun seeing the Muppets. Um, so, Bill, you do something at uh, Laughing Place called Touchstone and Beyond. What can you tell me about that? I know we've talked about it before on the show, but what have been some of the projects that you've covered lately on Touchstone and Beyond? Well, uh, I, I've, I'm an 80s child. I grew up with uh, Touchstone Pictures, and I grew up with uh, Dick Tracy and and all those films, especially with the lightning bolt coming across to, to show Touchstone Pictures and uh, a couple of years ago, I decided I wanted to go revisit these these little gems from the the Disney uh, vault. And uh, lately, I just rewatched Alive about the. Uh, well, that's the, a real uh, positive, um, cheerful, happy movie. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was looking. It's October, and so naturally, it's 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 scary month. And yeah. you know, I figure, oh, slasher films. Uh, well, let's go for something really horrific. Uh, being stuck in the Andes Mountain and. Uh, and trying to stay alive. And, and I tell you, it, it holds up directed by okay. Frank Marshall, produced by Kathleen Kennedy. Oh, uh, a I great... did not realize that. Yeah. The, I, I didn't either until I started rewatching it again. And I was like, Oh my, Oh my goodness. Uh, okay. uh, just, it holds up. Well, it's uh, it was a good story. And, and this week I would like to say the movie uh, cold Creek Manor is, is also fantastic, but uh, no, 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 it's no. not. Okay. It, no, no, <laughs> No, no. So yeah, I've been uh, just kind of perusing that, and I'm into year four, I think, of of getting through those uh, uh, those films. So some good ones, some bad ones, and some interesting ones. To say you can check those out on LaughingPlace.com. If you just t type in Touchstone in the search box up there, they'll all come up, I'm sure. Um, I also want to welcome and say hi to our semi regular guest co host Rebecca Mosley, who is back from her trip to. Florida. Rebecca, hi, how are you? How was your trip? What can you tell us? Any highlights from uh, being down down under, as they say? No, that's a different place. <laughs> um, down in down in the sunshine state. It was it was wonderful. It was not as sun. Well, no, it was sunshiny. It just wasn't as warm as it was supposed to be. In fact, the main goal of the trip was to visit Typhoon Lagoon for the first time with a oh. gal pal of mine. And uh, it was actually closed um, because of the cold. So that was a little dis disappointing, but I did get to finally, 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 Mike, I got to be a bounty hunter and oh, oh nice. did I have fun. <laughs> oh, what did you think of that? Uh, I, so I've been doing it myself. I've done three bounties. I feel like every time I go, I'm going to do one and I'll be like, okay, that's enough for today. I'll get some more next time. <laughs> I, how did you feel about the bounty hunting on Batu? I made sure to do five because with the five, then you get your um, your little icon in the Disney Play app that indicates okay. you're a bounty hunter. So I made sure to get my five because I don't get to go as frequently as you. Um, <laughs> and uh, it, it's, it's a lot of fun. I'm, there's things about it that I wish were different. I wish there were more places where I received my um target and i wish there were more places where i would claim my prize because you end up in kind of like a assembly line element and it's just it takes away from a bit of that kind of story flow yeah. that can get wrapped up in if you let yourself 
Sure. Um, and, but I, one of the things that I love about it, and it, it's something that as a kid I would have adored, um, there was a young man in front of me, um, and he was on his 16th bounty. Wow. And his mom stopped by while he was in line. She had a beer in hand, and she was like just checking in with him. And she's like, you're going to be doing this for a little while longer? And then, you know, it was like, you, clearly she was just going to go and en enjoy, you know, the right the the bright suns of uh, Batu and with the beer in hand while he was journeying all over. And I was like, oh, that would have been great. I, my parents would have loved that, just sitting in Batu while I was running around doing all this stuff. So Was it at least an in-universe Star Wars beer? I, I I couldn't tell. I couldn't okay. tell you. I couldn't. I couldn't tell you. <laughs> okay, uh, Bill. Uh, this is your second time on Who's the Boss, and that means you've graduated to level two of the five yes! Star Wars questions. Are you ready for this? I'm ready. Fire All right. away. Let's do it. Five Star Wars questions. Level two. Number one. Do you have a favorite line of dialogue from a Star Wars movie or TV show? Oh, um, it, it, it's, I read, you, I read your email that that and immediately Chewie were home and, and okay. that's just, it's just a feeling from, from Star Wars, no matter what it is, prequels, uh, original or sequels or the television shows, it just, it just feels comfortable. Like I, I just, I, I enjoy it, you know, and it's, I feel, I feel good whenever I'm, I'm watching Star Wars or, or reading Star Wars. So yeah, Chewie we're home. That's a that's a good one. I was in the room at Star Wars Celebration 2015 in Anaheim when they played that teaser trailer for Force oh. Awakens, or I think it was the full trailer, I guess. Um, and it had the, it ended with Han and Chewie boarding the Falcon and saying that yeah. line, and the whole place, of course, went completely nuts. Yeah, you know, it was the first time anybody had seen Harrison Ford playing Han Solo in however many years. However many decades or whatever. And he so, looked relatively yeah. happy when he said the line. Yeah, like he, yeah exactly. He, he didn't look miserable or, or, or grumpy or he, he right. looks like, yeah. I'm it wasn't like yeah. in Rise of Skywalker where he didn't bother shaving. <laughs> <laughs> well, he was a ghost. I mean, you right. know, standards for ghosts facial. just let themselves go <laughs> once you're gone. Uh, <laughs> or memories or whatever he was supposed to be. Okay. Uh, don't choke hmm. on your aspirations, says Mike Farnham. Yeah, that's a good one from Rogue One. Um, number two, which Star Wars planet would you like to live on and why? Oh, of course not. Um, I just, there's, I, you know, I'm not a, I'm not a person who wants to live in the Dagobah swamp. Uh, I don't, I don't really want to deal with the Ewoks, although I've got no, no, no complaints about the Ewoks. I love them. So I don't want to go to, to Endor. Uh, Coruscant, there's, there's opportunity. There's, there's all sorts of places you could explore. Uh, you can get lost in Coruscant, or you could become a senator and and meet ET. Uh, but yeah, Coruscant, I want to be there. We're, we're going to talk about Andor a bit later, and and quite a bit of that show has taken place on Coruscant. Has the uh, depiction of Coruscant in Andor changed your opinion on it at all? Because it it feels a little more I don't know how to say it uh, depressing, I guess in in, in Andor. I. No, I don't think it's changed my my opinion of it or, or depiction. I I've read a lot of the old expanded universe books, yeah. and and I mean, there's a lot that happens on Coruscant. I always I always kind of imagined as to what it would look like or, or what it would be like, and you know, I mean, it's the time of the Empire when everything is militaristic and and depressing. So I mean, the yeah, the decor matches matches the atmosphere, so to speak. I, I always what I like about Coruscant is when I, when you land on the planet, you land on like the top level where yeah. all the rich people and the you know the politicians and the Jedi all live. And then as you go down the levels, it gets more and more like grimy and dingy and uh, becomes the deniz the denizens of all you know all the uh, underworld and uh, scum and villainy of the galaxy live down there. See, so there's kind plenty of, of yeah. opportunity there. Yeah, <laughs> you could Coruscant find anything. welcomes everybody yes the rich exactly. and the scum of the universe so there exactly. you go exactly love that choice okay number three this is a long question but it's going to be a short answer i think uh what's your favorite storytelling era in star wars so i oh. always list out these uh many many options you've got the old republic though that's thousands of years before the original trilogy the high republic is hundreds of years before the original trilogy then you've got the prequel era 
Then you've got the reign of the empire, which is between the prequels and the original trilogy, like Andor. Then you've got the age of rebellion, which is the original trilogy itself, the galactic civil war. The new Republic is uh, Mandalorian and book of Boba Fett and upcoming show Ahsoka between return of the Jedi and the force awakens. Then you've got, uh, the sequel trilogy era and then you've got uh, i also like to include the legends timeline which is the old canon of uh, books and comic books that took place uh in and you know around the movies after return of the jedi and uh those those have all been decanonized i guess or made into a, a separate canon called legends so of those choices bill uh which would you say is your favorite I got to give a shout out to the High Republic. I love it all. Okay. I love the books. I love the the storyline. I love where it's going. I, I can't wait for more. Uh, but the Legends. Uh, I legends. Just, that's the Legends, the Legends era. I like that. What if, if we just continued the story? And yeah. granted, I mean, there are some books that you don't need to ever reread. Uh, but the, the whole like the Yuzhan Vong war uh, yeah. mm -hmm. and, and seeing what happens with Jaina and Jason and, and Anakin there as they grow up and, and Luke founding the, the Jedi Academy. I just, I love it all. Uh, it's just that, that era really speaks to me. It's uh, it's a what if it's a what if scenario. You know? Yeah. I, I love legends as well. I, in fact, I recently went to Wikipedia and typed in like, legends timeline or whatever and you can just bring up a list of basically every story that was ever published in legends and i just started at the beginning <laughs> like i'm doing the um old republic comic books right now which i'd never read yeah. before i bought the big like hardbound uh, um omnibus edition so i'm reading all those oh. uh and i really want to you know there's just as amazing as it sounds there's still a lot of star wars that i haven't consumed but there's just so much out there and a lot of it is that in that legends timeline so i've been revisiting that and, and it is very interesting um mike farnham says he's mentioned in a legends book by kevin j anderson who wrote mm. the uh, the jedi academy trilogy nice in there so mike you got to tell us which book that is and we'll have to look for it yeah for sure. um, it's probably number, on my yeah. shelf yeah maybe maybe i have it as well number four which star wars creature would you like to have as a pet Oh, as a pet? Yeah. Or as a friend? Well, it can't be a sentient creature. It can't be like a Wookiee. It would have oh. to be like a like a Bantha or um, a Womp Rat or something, you know? I'll take so, a Bantha. I want okay. a Bantha. Yeah. You want a Bantha? You ride around on it? Yeah, why not? They seem okay. like they'd be fun. and Yeah, I want a Bantha. That's what okay. I want. I like it. That's, it'd All be right. hard to feed, though. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'll be... still take a Bantha. Okay, that the desert the deserts of Tatooine don't grow a lot of um, food for the for the beasts of burden there. Um, maybe easy to feed. Maybe maybe the bantha is a smart choice. Maybe grocery right. bill just went down. <laughs> <laughs> Number five, the fifth and final of the five Star Wars questions, level two. Which filmmaker or author? Would you like to see create a Star Wars story? Let's say you're Kathleen Kennedy. You can call in anybody you want for a meeting for them to uh, pitch their own Star Wars story. Who would it be? Okay. Um, uh, Kenneth Branagh. I want to see what he okay. would do. I would love mm -hmm. to see him maybe pitch uh, or maybe him do a, an old uh, Knights of the Old Republic, something that would give him a, a chance to bring a little Shakespearean drama yeah. like he did with mm -hmm. Thor, uh, yeah. Kenneth Branagh. I just, I'm a huge fan of the, the Poirot movies and I love what he did with that. So um, yeah, Branagh, Branagh all the way. That's a great choice. And I don't think we've heard that one before. So yeah, I, I love it. Kenneth Branagh. Great. Okay. That's the end of the five Star Wars questions. That's going to bring us to Star Wars headlines for the week. And the big, big news coming out of this past week was we found out about a secret Star Wars movie that has been in development, apparently, over there at Lucasfilm. It's being co-written by Damon Lindelof, who was one of the showrunners on Lost. And, you know, we've talked about Lost before in this show. I know the Mosleys are fans of Lost. I'm a big fan of Lost. Do you like Lost, Bill Gausel? Oh, yes, I do. Yeah, I've okay. got, uh, uh, yeah, oh, followed it right from the first episode to the end. It's uh, okay. It's a great show. 
Um, yeah, Love Lost. I also love um, his show, The Leftovers, on HBO. Mm-hmm. Thought that was fantastic. Mm-hmm. And he did the Watchmen sequel series, which I also thought was really great. He's done some movies that were kind of hit or miss, but I gotta say, I'm really excited to see what Damon Lindelof has up his sleeve for Star Wars. He's going to be co-writing this movie with a man named Justin Britt Gibson, who uh, wrote something called The Strain and another TV show called The Strain. Oh. Um, and it's it'll be directed by Charmin Obaid Chinoy, and I apologize if I am mispronouncing that name, but she was the director in charge of Ms. Marvel, which I thought was wonderfully directed um, over there uh, at Marvel Studios for Disney+. Plus. What do you guys think about this? Rebecca, are you excited for this move, this news, this movie that could, I mean, <laughs> so we, we approach this, uh, the way we approach all these projects, which is you, you won't believe it until it's actually exactly. uh, in right? <laughs> Correct. I get excited when there's a trailer because I mean, <laughs> I know that that means that there's enough done that t- probably more than likely something will end up actually on screen, whether it's a big one or a little one, but until then, I just don't get my hopes up. Fair, fair enough. We certainly saw um, they had to cancel or postpone this date that they had coming up for a Star Wars movie in 2023. So it seems likely that we won't see one on the big screen until 2025, which was the next date that they had kind of staked out. What about you, Bill? Are you excited for this? If it happens... Uh I, I am. I, I hope it does. Although I think I see Rogue Squadron flying by right now um, yeah. <laughs> into the oblivion. Uh, I, I think Lindelof is great. I love Lost. I, I followed it all the way through. I'd be very interested to see what he has to do. Uh, if it's got the sequel characters and the sh- movie doesn't have John Boyega in it, um, I'm, I'm going to be disappointed. I want to see more of Finn. Um mm. And I think if if I have any one complaint really about the sequel series is he was set up so well in The Force Awakens and then it just kind of petered off. I would I would love to see a whole movie of just him and Finn uh, trying to reckon with is he a Jedi? Is he going to pursue this or is he going to do something else? But yeah, I'm excited. I mean, all Star Star Wars is good. Star Wars even the bad star wars so. <laughs> yeah we should say uh since you didn't mention it that part of this news that came out was that apparently this movie is going to be set after episode nine after the rise of skywalker and may incorporate some of those sequel trilogy characters i know that john boyega has come out and said that he isn't necessarily interested in returning to star wars although like oscar isaac recently has said that he might be up for it i think maybe because he was probably attached to that rogue squadron movie which was all supposed to be also supposed to be set in that era so it kind of remains to be seen i'm sure we'll find out more maybe at celebration i don't know who knows yeah Yeah. um but we'll find out and we'll we'll uh post any news about that on laughingplace.com so stay tuned to that speaking of celebration we did get some key art for star wars celebration 2023 in london which is going to be happening in april of next year a mere what six months from now Wow. Uh, I'll be at Star Wars wow. Celebration, my first time in London. Very excited. And it's some very nice looking key art with the Death Star and a bunch of Star Wars ships uh, over the London skyline and a nice painted backdrop there. So very excited for Star Wars Celebration. Uh, and then thirdly, we've got a comic book that I read and reviewed this week called Star Wars Dr. Afra number 25. That was the only comic that came out this week and I enjoyed it. I for the most part, I usually enjoy Dr. Afra. Have you checked out Dr. Afra at all, Bill? Have we talked about this before? Um, I, I I haven't, and okay. I've been I've been very negligent in the uh, the comic yeah. book area of Star Wars. Um, but no, I, I haven't. What's is it? You highly recommend it? Yeah, I you know start at the beginning with Dr. Afra because she first appeared in the Darth Vader comics as kind of her new assistant um and then she got spun off into her own title but she's sort of the indiana jones of the star wars galaxy now she's, a, she's like a rogue archaeologist although she borders more on the the line between good and evil she's kind of like amoral and a, you know indiana jones always ends up doing the right thing dr afra is really riding that line but um yeah uh, just check out dr afra i okay. always recommend it um and then we got Oh, I feel like this is a good place for you to step in, Rebecca, because we had a week two of Star Wars Bring Home the Galaxy, which is the new 
merchandise roundup that Lucasfilm and Disney products is doing every week uh, leading up to the holiday season. So what were some of the highlights from the products that got revealed this week? Uh, we Rebecca? actually talked a lot about this on Barely Necessities. So um, for details, I would say be sure to stop by Barely Necessities that um, we recorded earlier this week. You can find it right here on this channel. But for you, Mike, I pulled up some of the items that I thought were kind of adorable. I thought you and Bill might want to talk about them. Beginning with this plush figure where when you um, push on the little uh, button there by his arm, the lightsaber will light up and a voice altering activation will start so that when you speak, it will come out <laughs> Vader-esque. So oh, it's a, a voice awesome. changing plush. <laughs> I like it. That's awesome. <laughs> and then there's a some new flannel uh, featuring a Mandalorian, various phrases from the Mandalorian. So as the weather changes here, if you're looking for something kind of in between that uh, sweatshirt and heavy jacket. You've got some flannel options. Uh, some holiday pajamas for the whole family are available featuring uh, various, uh, I would say villains, but you know, that's just me, Darth Vader in them. Um, and you mentioned the High Republic earlier. So uh, Loungefly has a backpack. Um, is this um, character, is it Scree? Am I? No, it's something like that. Sc Mm, that doesn't sound familiar to me. Oh man, I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna kick myself for not writing that down. But um, so this is um from the High High Republic. Let me uh just pull up this next one. Okay. Um, and this is a very uh high uh detailed uh piece, and it is one of the uh, denizens of uh Cantina Bill. So there you go. Yeah, that's the uh, Duros species of alien. That hangs out in the canteen. The same species as Cad Bane, the bounty hunter. Um, I was. I am also going to scroll down real quick and gather that name because it's going to bother okay. me that I did it. I That's didn't fine. I, I apologize for not knowing. No, no, either. no. It's on me. Totally on me. And it is Keeve. I see. Oh, I have Keeve. the vowels okay. right. Keeve. Keeve. So Trenis. Keeve. Yeah, Keeve Trennis is one of the Jedi characters from uh, the High Republic. Oh. So that's. That looks very cool. And, and you can that check mini out, bust, of yeah. course, was from Gentle Giant. So Okay, great. And all that information is on laughingplace.com. Of course, if you just type in Bring Home the Galaxy on the search bar there, you can find out all about all that merchandise. And then, um, oh, we, you know what was very cool this week? Uh, Disney Products reached out to us and offered the opportunity for us to have a, an exclusive merchandise reveal for Star Wars, which is very exciting for us. And we got to be the ones. LaughingPlace.com was able to exclusively, exclusively reveal these two new lightsaber hilts from uh, Doc Ondar's Den of Antiquities coming to Star Wars Galaxy's Edge. And it's also, they're both, I think, available now for pre-order on Shop Disney. So it's Qui-Gon Jinn and... Jedi Master Dooku, before he became Count Dooku, when he was still a Jedi Master, uh, you can get both of their lightsaber hilts as featured in the Tales of the Jedi animated shorts that we're going to be talking about here in a little bit. And I think um, all the information is there on our post of how to get it, the prices, uh, what they feature, and there are very high quality lightsabers, of course, that will be coming to Doc Ondar's there on both coasts at Star Wars Galaxy's Edge, right, Re right, Rebecca? As as far as I know, yeah, Mike. Um, and then for me, the thing that caught my eye was this um, play tent. And boy, do I wish this had oh. been available when I was a kid. I don't know about you guys, but when this popped up uh, over at Shop Disney, I became very jealous of kids <laughs> nowadays. Yeah, that's, that's pretty sweet. That's it's awesome. Like the cockpit of the Millennium Falcon, oh. so you can all sit in there and pretend like you're flying the ship. That's, oh. that's yeah. pretty fantastic. <laughs> Uh, I was at Disneyland Resort this past week, and I noticed a new feature in the Star Wars trading post at Downtown Disney, and it's this machine. They actually have this machine in the Pieces of Eight shop in New Orleans Square as well, where you could get, or I'm not sure if it's still there, but you could get uh, souvenir medallions from Pirates of the Caribbean, and now they've got it for the Mandalorian in the Star Wars trading post. There's four different medallions. One is Din Djarin, one is Ahsoka Tano, one is Grogu. And who was the fourth one? I'm blanking the on it. The Mythosaur Skull. Oh, right. The Mythosaur Skull insignia. And then on the back of all the coins is the Star Wars, the Mandalorian logo. And you can get all four for $15 total. They're they're nice and big size coins. Um, and I think I was kind of hoping that they would release some kind of 
frame or something for them because they're just kind of like loose in my apartment or in my backpack now. But um, I did really like, you know, I like when they do new, new merchandise, stuff like that. Um, so I was glad to pick those up. And then lastly, in Star Wars headlines for this week, another new character poster from Andor. And this is the character named Clea Markey, who is Luthen Rail's assistant in the uh, antique shop. And she's also his assistant in building this rebellion as well. And she features into this week's episode. So we'll be talking about her in a little bit. But first, I want to ask you guys about Star Wars Tales of the Jedi, which is the new series of animated shorts. There's six shorts on Disney+. Plus. They're already out. And they are created by Dave Filoni, of course, who's the mastermind behind uh, almost all the Star Wars animation stuff. And uh, they so three of the episodes focus on Ahsoka Tano and three of the episodes focus on Count Dooku or Jedi Master Dooku. And, I, you know, I was uh, interested in this when they announced it. I would they did it. They did a panel on it at Star Wars Celebration. I was kind of intrigued. I saw the first one there. And then when I finally got to sit down and watch them. Uh, when I got a screener a couple of weeks ago, I thought they were very good. Uh, what did you guys think, Bill? How did you feel about Tales of the Jedi? Um, I, I, I was, I was excited. I, I love the fact that it was like 15, 16 minutes, so I can consume them pretty quickly. Yeah. Um, you know, and I sat down. I got up to episode four, and I loved those three episodes with Dooku and seeing Jedi Master Dooku, how he evolves and and what he, what he becomes and what he's like. And I, I don't I don't know if it's just me. The first episode being about Ahsoka, and then we go into Dooku. Right. I, I was I I wonder. Well, I was I wasn't very impressed by the first episode. And I was yeah, it's fine. But it's like, is is that the first one? And and then once they got into Dooku, I'm like, okay, well, I'm hooked. I'm I'm into this right, right now. Um, but overall, I mean, I liked it. I like the fact that it's it's condensed, um, yeah. and I also like the fact that we get we get more on Dooku. I have a lot more more interest in that character as opposed to um, seeing him in the prequel trilogy. Like I, he's he's torn. He he's more of a human that you know. I uh, what's uh, the the one Jedi from the High Republic, Elazar. Elzar Man. Oh, El Elzar Man, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I feel like there's there's almost kind of a, a connection there. Like whenever I read about his his being torn as he you know tries to follow the ways of the Jedi, but also follows his own instincts. And I kind of kind of saw a little bit of that with uh, with Dooku. But overall, yeah. I mean, bring it on! Like I can't wait to see the last two and see how it finishes off. Yeah, I was puzzled by that choice as well to start it off with the Ahsoka episode, then do all three Dooku episodes, then do the final two. Uh, but I think, I mean, there must have been a reasoning behind that. I don't, I don't, I don't think it's like a chronological order. I don't think that quite makes sense. But um, what would you say, Rebecca? I think it sets the table well in that I think in some ways we're looking at a contrast of individuals. Both individuals were let down by the system. Mm -hmm. And and both of them walk away from the system. One opts out of the system. The other one selects a different system, as right. it were. And so <laughs> for me, I just thought it, it was an interesting an interesting way to kind of set that up because um, Ahsoka never loses sight of the light side. Yeah. Whereas Dooku gets absorbed into the to the dark side, and I think in part because he's been let down by the system. And he's kind of searching for resolution and he en ends up on that other on that other path. And so for me, I felt like it was kind of helping us set the table in that way of, of how once when sometimes when you're lost within the system, you can end up reaching for the wrong thing. So that was sure. kind of where I went with it. Yeah, it is a really interesting kind of juxtaposition between these two characters. Uh, but like you, Bill, I did enjoy the Dooku episodes more. I think because we just haven't spent a lot of time with that character, and I do find him very interesting. There's the audio drama called Dooku Jedi Lost, which I also really liked by Kevin Scott, which I recommend checking out if you are interested in learning more about Dooku's story. Um, but yeah, this getting to see him like acting as a like what he was like when he was a Jedi Master and how you can see those little hints of why he chose the path he did ultimately. 
I just really uh, liked getting to see all that stuff. And my favorite episode, I think, was the final Dooku episode, the one that heavily features Yaddle, I guess we'll say. Um, I don't know. Did you guys have a, a favorite? Was it that one or did you uh, have others that stuck out to you as being um, the best in your book? Yeah. Um, for for me, I, I, I like the episode with Yaddle. Uh, I also love what's going around on social media about how Yaddle is speaking clearly and perfectly. Yeah. And, <laughs> and a lot of people are talking about how Yoda is just doing that to mess with people. And, <laughs> and, and that's like, you know, he's just a crazy goblin that's causing trouble. With <laughs> right. um, I, I, I really, really liked the episodes with Dooku and I haven't seen the last two with uh, Ahsoka yet, but I, I just found like, it, it, it's it's interesting a character that you don't know too much about yeah. and within that 15 17 minute time frame you, you get such a, a perspective on him and i was feeling like oh yeah i, I kind of understand why <laughs> and, I, and i'm not trying yeah. to say i would go off right. and, and, and join the uh the empire there but it, it just it brings the humanity the the realism to it as opposed to just a bunch of space wizards with uh with laser swords you know uh Absolutely. It feels real, you know, and they're, yeah. they're humans. Yeah, you're giving definitely giving more depth to these characters. And we should mention that Yaddle is, in fact, voiced by Bryce Dallas Howard, who has directed a couple episodes of The Mandalorian and The Book of Boba Fett. And, of course, has ties to Lucasfilm because her father is the filmmaker Ron Howard, filmmaker and actor also Ron Howard. Um, but, yeah, I think she did a great job. There's Bryce's tweet Rebecca had that ready to go. Uh, her tweet uh, announcing that she had voiced Yaddle in Tales of the Jedi. What about you, Rebecca? Did you have any favorite moments or episodes that we haven't really touched on yet? Um, I I enjoyed seeing more of Ahsoka and Anakin. That always makes me happy. Yeah. So um, the fact, I, unlike you guys, I was very, very happy <laughs> to see a lot more Ahsoka. That's, I don't have a problem oh, no. with Ahsoka. I just feel like we've... We've seen her quite a bit. You know? I am I am very excited for the live action show. I think, yeah. uh, and her appearance at, at the end of Rebels season season one, I think it was. I I loved it. I just, I just, it was nice to see more of Dooku, and yeah. and it's <laughs> terrible. I know it's I, no. I'm just I'm just giving you guys a hard time. Um, yeah, but like I say, for, for me, it was really, I, I enjoyed, I enjoyed the elements of see, uh, I just, I like when Anakin and Ahsoka are on screen together. And I, I really love, cause it always brings up kind of that what if, um, of, of, you know, their past yeah. and where things yes. might've gone, um, had she, you know, been still more around as it were. Um, so yeah, just, uh, I, uh. That was that just made me happy. I, I I just there's just something about Ahsoka, the optimism, the embrace of of the light, the always looking to be helpful. That just I enjoy whenever I have a chance to spend more time um, with that character. I don't want to spoil too much for Bill because he hasn't seen those last two. But I want to bring up this point that I was thinking about with that episode with Anakin, um, because there's this kind of poetic irony that he's training her to survive this moment later on in the story do you do you think the implication is that maybe anakin due to his uh mm -hmm. superior force abilities had a maybe an innate or subconscious knowledge of what was to come and set up ahsoka for survival because of that or do you think it it's a coincidence <laughs> for I, I i don't know saying it's a coincidence out loud i'm like well nothing's really a coincidence in star wars right but that but you bring up one of the things that i really appreciated about this series and and that is that there were various moments in it that i didn't feel like we were forced into a perception of what that meant um for example the moment when ahsoka is confronted with that beast there's yeah. a sense that maybe it's force sensitive, but maybe not. Maybe it's just that innate, uh, you know, yeah. desire to just confront something, which seems to be who Ahsoka is. And similarly, like what you're bringing up here, is there is there is it coincidence or is there no such thing as co coincidence? Yeah. And I feel like there were various little kind of elements of that that Filoni lets us interpret. He gives us a moment, but he yeah. doesn't spell it out for us and make us kind of you know have one way of, of considering it. 
so when I first saw that moment that you're talking about in the first episode, it was on the big screen at Star Wars Celebration. And I first thought of Grogu with the Rancor in mm -hmm. the Book of Boba Fett, where he does kind of the same thing. And of course, my head went to the Force, like, okay, they're both Force powerful or whatever, and they're able to calm these animals. It's just one of the powers that they have. But then during the Q&A, Dave Filoni was talking about that ambiguity that you mentioned, how it could be the Force or it could just be Ahsoka being centering herself and being calm in that moment. And then he he added to that by saying, or is there really a difference between those two things? And then I I was like, okay, this this guy gets it, you know? <laughs> like, okay. Like, I, I don't know. I've always been hesitant about this idea of just like handing over the keys of Star Wars to Dave Filoni. Because I, in the past, I've thought, you know, Clone Wars is kind of hit or miss for me. And you know, Rebels is really growing on me in this rewatch. But when I first watched it, I thought, okay, it got better as it went along. Um, but I don't know. I think of all the people who's who are involved with Star Wars right now, whenever he talks, I, I get the idea that he really thinks about this kind of thing a lot. And he can tune into really what makes Star Wars tick on a way that I don't think anybody else really has access to. And have, having worked directly under George Lucas, I think probably really helps. So he he definitely, to me, seems like the heir apparent to Mr. Lucas uh, at the moment. Um, but uh, anything else that you guys want to say about Tales of the Jedi before we move on? Um, yeah, uh, okay. I, I want more. I, okay. I, I oh, want, yeah, yeah, yeah. I want uh, I want more to I want more stuff like this and right. more context, more more stories. You know, uh... I, yes, yeah, so I'd actually had this as a bullet point on the outline here and I forgot to mention it. But I yeah, I just love the idea that you can go and fill in these gaps in the timeline of these specific characters and Dave Filoni being it seems like he's the right guy to do it. So if you guys could pick, let's say each pick one character for Dave Filoni to in the whole Star Wars timeline or whatever for Dave Filoni to just kind of do some little animated shorts about well, who else would you like to see him tackle in this way? Chewbacca, I, I would, I and I, and I know we get a lot about him, but I, I and I've read the 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 legends about how Han meets with with Chewbacca and how yeah, but I would love to see. I mean, it's not like Chewbacca and Han were side by side for for ever and every single moment. I would love to see Chewbacca in in his own. I'd love to see Kashyyyk. I'd love to yeah. see him go back there. Mm -hmm. uh, I would I would love to see more of him. Yeah. I got a little thing you can watch called the Star Wars Holiday Special. Um, <laughs> I said I want more, not old. <laughs> what about you, Rebecca? No. It's it's hard because it for me it kind of falls into the "be careful what you wish for" category. So I'll tell you what I wish for, but yet I don't know that I wish for it. And then I'll tell you what I would like them to actually do. Okay. Okay. Yes. Um, Luke and Leia post Return of the Jedi. Um, yes. Yeah. But but yes. it terrifies me, because yeah. <laughs> right. So instead, what I'll say is Qui Gon Jinn. I would like yes. I would like to see Qui Gon Jinn more deeply explored. <laughs> yes. I I was thinking about this recently, and I'll say it here. I will be shocked if we don't eventually get some kind of either animated or live action show set after Return of the Jedi that's just called like the New Republic or something, because. I mean, I don't know if it would necessarily focus on Luke and Leia, but I just I feel like we have this actress now playing Mon Mothma and Andor and the other stuff that she's done, Rogue One. Um, and she's so wonderful as as that character. It would be a shame not to see how Mon Mothma rebuilds the Republic after mm. the fall of the Empire as played by Genevieve O'Reilly. And what a wonderful segue that is into talking about Star Wars and or episode eight, which was titled Narkina five. Uh, when I saw that uh, title pop up, I was like, what does that mean? And then we found out. So, Bill, let's start with you. Before we get into this week's episode, I want to ask you, uh, what were your expectations before Andor started when you first heard about it? What did you think about it going in? And then what what did you think of the previous seven episodes? 
Well, I remember the last time I was on the show, we talked about favorite Star Wars movies. And I said, oh, you know, episode four, it's the beginning. But, you know, for a very close second, it'd be Rogue One. Because I, I really, I, I love the film. I thought it was, it was different, but yet it's still set in the same world. And, and I love the characters. I loved uh, Cassian and I love Jin Erso. Uh, if we don't see Jin Erso come back, I'll, I'll be shocked. Um, I'm, I almost put money on it that she's going to be here in some way, shape or form. Okay. Um, but I, I had high expectations uh, because uh, Cassian's a great character. This is a great setup based on what we saw. And Tony Gilroy um, is brilliant. He's uh, he's fantastic, uh, and Michael Clayton is one of my favorite films. Oh, uh, his his work on there, it, and that's a that's a, a legal drama that's a mystery with, you know, oh something's going on, and it's it's on the edge of your seat, and I love mm. that, and knowing that he was uh, in charge and running the show and creating, I I was pumped for it. I was happy to to get back into this. Um, I, and unlike some of the, like, I'll admit this right now. I haven't seen the Obi-Wan show okay. and, and I, I, I know, I know Rebecca, it's, I know, <laughs> I know. It's like, he's one of my favorite legacy characters th there is. And I was excited. I love you and McGregor and I have every plan to watch it. Uh, it, it, when it came out, it was like, Oh, I missed it this week. And, and then another thing came up and then school started to end. And then we had, uh, ballet recitals and ball hockey tournaments and then oh we're in the middle of july and so like and and on your disney plus new on disney plus it's now gone further down um yeah. and so i i just i've lost it and like oh you know i'll get to it some other time this don't, don't feel too bad bill because i i consume star wars for a living full time and i always feel like i'm behind so <laughs> i can't imagine what it's like for fans who like have a life outside of Star Wars <laughs> and are trying to consume Star Wars. So yeah, there's nothing well, to apologize for there. Well, and that's, and that's the thing though. Like I really loved Obi-Wan and I was looking forward to seeing you and McGregor come back. Um, but no, well, I'll get to it later. Whereas this, I, I wanted to see what they did and I really wanted to see what, what Diego Luna was going to do and how he was going to uh, bring this character back and what was his life like before he became the, the really hot shot, uh, member of the rebel of the rebellion there and yeah. yeah high expectations for sure and and uh what did you end up thinking about the uh first seven episodes not counting this week i read your review that included the the first three episodes and about how okay. it's a slow burn and so yeah. i i like that and i i kind of tuned out everything else after that and taking your words uh oh do we lose did we bill just lose him well, I'm sure he'll be back. <laughs> Hopefully he'll be back shortly. Uh, well, while we're waiting for Bill to return, um, Rebecca, why don't we talk about... Uh, uh, oh. Um, oh. My, is there is Hello? There? Hello. Uh, hmm. I'm going to try I, removing you from I, screen and let you sign back in, Bill. I, I, oh, there he is. Oh, wait. Do you see me? Yeah. I think you're there. Yeah. I'm thinking I'm thinking I'm going to I'm going to remove it and let let you sign back in, Bill. Just use that same link that that you were right here. We'll see if that okay. if he can uh So I just got to remember about 45 minutes to make an edit. <laughs> no, no, no worries. Cuz I can see I can see him down in the green room, so when it starts to look like it's selling back out, I'll bring him I'll bring him back in. Okay. But, um, in the meantime, Mike, I will say that this was the first episode I wasn't looking at my watch, which really? I know must amaze you, because you you described it as grinding the series to a halt. Um, yeah, I, it's funny because Alex from I watched Alex's review on Star Wars Explained this morning, and he said it was his favorite episode so far, and it it's definitely my least favorite episode this week of and i've seen the i've seen two after this so i would say that this episode episode eight is my least favorite of those 10 that i've seen um and i just feel like uh, uh, we'll get back to you in a second bill so i'm just gonna finish this thought um as soon as i saw that prison i thought oh they they built sets they built some 
big sets for this. We're going to be here for a while. And I was like, oh, oh no. But we'll talk about the prison more in a minute. Let's let's have Bill finish his uh, thought about um, the previous seven. Well, hello there. I don't know what happened, but yeah. I got booted out there. Um, yeah, pre previous seven. Uh, I liked the build up. The first three episodes, my, my one comment. Cassie Nandor really didn't do much to take away attention from himself. He's constantly walking around like like he's up to something. And I, it's like he, you stick out like a sore thumb. Like everybody you walk by knows, yeah, he's up to something. He did something yeah. like, like <laughs> what are you doing? Like, stop, stop marching around like you're you're up to up to no good. Like, you know, maybe kind of slow down vary your pace maybe you know go to work one day right. so that they're they're <laughs> not gonna wonder where where has he been he hasn't been here in a week um you know and that's that's a small nitpick there um uh but overall i uh stone scar uh oh, his boy, yeah. role as luthan so good i just i i empathize with his feelings on on so many ways um and his just I gotta put my my professional face on, and I'm like, oh, just you know, um, <laughs> um, yeah. I, I think I think the cast having Genevieve O'Reilly back and and just seeing more behind of of Mon Mothma before she becomes the leader of the rebellion. She's the senator. I I'm just I'm I'm eating it up, um, and, and really really happy with what they're doing. And it is slow. It uh, I mean, it's not we're we're going to hyperspace and blasting a bunch of Tie fighters. Um, but I, I like I like the change. That's for sure. I'm I'm really glad you're enjoying it. I know that the Rebecca has struggled with some previous episodes, but while you were gone, she made the shocking revelation that uh, I guess this was the most entertaining of the episodes she's seen so far. So Rebecca, why don't you elaborate on that? What did what did you like about this week's episode? I, I suspect it's just the juxtaposition between the Mon Mothma scenes and, and the Cassian, you know, scenes or the scenes that weren't her, you know, yeah. um, I, I very much enjoyed that, that um, contrast. Um, and so I think it kept my attention better. Um, but overall, I'm not a big heist fan person. So I don't feel like I was learning very much about Cassian Andor before. Because yeah. I, I I knew he was a guy who was, you know, kind of money for hire, you know? He was like, I need money. I, here's an opportunity. I'm going to take it and make money. But I feel like now I'm going to see why he was willing to do what we saw him do in Rogue One. And I feel like now I'm really getting a sense of his motivation of who Cassian Andor, when I saw him on the big screen, even though I only saw it on an airplane, when I saw it on the big screen, um, you know, why he was that person. I don't really feel like kind of a lot of what I was seeing before as far as the dynamics of that was really leading me there in the same way. Okay. Um, I, I'll tell you what bugged me about this episode the first time I watched it. Because uh, the second time I saw it, I, I rewatched it last night and I liked it more. Just kind of having that knowledge of what was coming helped, I think. But when I first realized that he was, you know, arrested at the end of last week's episode and probably going to an Imperial prison, I, I immediately, I mean, it's my fault for having built my own expectations, I think, you know, but I had this image of what the prison would look like. And it, the prison in my head was much more star Wars than what we got because the prison that we got this Imperial factory prison, there you go. You had the, uh, you had the still ready to go. I, I'm so happy. It was just THX 1138. A lot of people had noticed this. I, I wrote it in my review, which I wrote before the episode came out. So I know uh, I wasn't influenced by anyone else. But uh, a lot of people had independently come up with this comparison. And I think it was intentional um, that they drew from George Lucas's first movie, um thx 1138 and designing this prison but thx is very like hard sci-fi and star wars is a space fantasy and it's i don't know it's supposed to be like colorful and fun and this just felt so very sterile and dystopian and uh it just didn't feel star wars to me once we got in that prison it's still it's still good it's still an entertaining show and well written but it didn't feel like star wars 
to me. The other thing that bugged me about this episode was that it just didn't feel like we were getting any forward momentum. When we cut to Mon Mothma, I felt like she she's always having the same conversation in her <laughs> apartment at the cocktail party. Like it's just it almost felt like I was watching an episode that I had seen already. Like the guy from Chandrilla showed up and they're talking about getting her money. So the wheels felt like they were spinning in that way. I thought that the stuff with uh, Cyril Karn, the uh, de facto villain guy, the Weasley guy, was interesting because he finally got to meet the ISB agent. But then, like, he's like, oh, I want to be an ISB agent as well. And she just, like, dismisses him. And she's like, no, uh, you go back to work in your boring office job. So that was kind of a false start. And then we get uh, Forrest Whitaker is back as Saw Guerrera, And... Stellan Skarsgård goes and talks to him and he's like, you should work with this other rebel group. And Saw Gerrera is like, no. <laughs> so it was just this list of like things that wanted to happen, but didn't happen. And that, that was frustrating to me uh, by the end of the first time I watched this episode. Like I said, the second time I watched it, I knew what to expect and I could appreciate it for what it was. What about you, Bill? What did you think of episode eight and the stuff that we've touched on already or anything that came to your mind? Uh, for me, he, he's coming off, Cassian's coming off this heist. He's probably, he tries to get his mom out. His mom says, no, he, he's, he's at the best he's ever been. And I, I mean, predictably something's going to go wrong. And, and he gets, he gets put into prison. I, for me, I like the fact that it was a very sterile, very white environment. Yeah. And and I, li I liked it for, for this reason, because it shows that, you know, the empire is more than just we're working on the spice mines or, or we're, we're on some asteroid. There were these miserable, horrible, like very clean, very, very dull places where they kept you uh, in prison. And I like the fact that I saw this episode as like, we're going to see how Luthen is going to evolve. He's going out to Saw. He's going out trying to get him. He's realizing I've got to do more. I've got to try and bring everybody together. And, and like what you you talked about there for a little bit, Rebecca, I, I think we're going to see the Cassian who we get in Rogue One. And I think this prison experience uh, is really going to form the core of who he becomes. We, we already know that Cassian is a guy who will shoot first. Um, and, and I liked in, in the previous episode where, uh, you know, they've, they've got off there and they're on the planet where they're trying to get the one guy medical help. And the other guy, I forget their names, he, he's talking to him, well, we could just split it and leave now. And, and Cassian shoots him within a couple of seconds. And that, that kind of parallels perfectly with, with Rogue One where he shoots the informant who can't mm -hmm. climb. He's like, oh, you don't need to worry. Like it, you, you see bits of the Cassian we met in Rogue One, but the the re the rebel himself, the real rebel that we see from Rogue One is is going to be formed starting now because everything else was mercenary for hire. He's going to actually believe in something, I, I think. So that's yeah. that's where I'm at. I think that makes sense to me. Uh, I wanted to mention this episode was directed by Toby Haynes, who had done a lot of uh, the BBC's Sherlock with Benedict Cumberbatch. Um, it was written by Bo Willimon, who did uh, House Ooh, of Cards. I cards. think he was the creator Executive of, producer, uh, yeah. of House of Cards. Cinematographer was Adriano Goldman or Adriano Goldman from The Crown. The editor was Matthew Cannings from Black Mirror. And I, I wanted to pay special attention to the production designer, who I don't know if I've mentioned him before on this podcast, but uh, his name is Luke Hall, and he's been the production designer for the whole series of Andor so far. And I think... As much as as much as the prison wasn't what I had pictured in my head, I think it is incredibly interesting looking um, from the the way the bunks are shaped. I I keep thinking I want to build them in Lego. The way these like L shaped bunks kind of connect and overlap with each other, and then the the work floor it, it's just all so cool looking and memorable. I think, and you know, we are going to be spending a few episodes here. So um, it is nice that we have something neat to look at for at the very least. And then we got to talk about some of these new characters that show up because the guy, this, the, the supervisor on this factory floor in the prison is played by none other than Andy Serkis, 
from the Lord of the Rings trilogy, uh, who he was Gollum, of course, and he was Snoke in the Star Wars sequel trilogy. Uh, what did you think when you first saw Andy Circus pop up, Bill? Oh, of course, it's King Kong coming in there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, um, based on you reading the the credits there as to who was involved, it, of course, Andy Serkis would be in there. And and he he's always been given so much credit for his motion capture work and the actor himself without the motion capture. He, he projects, you know, that that authority, that presence, but also kind of that tinge of evil or, or violence. Uh, I thought he was perfect. Uh, if anybody who I'd meet in a prison who's the prison boss, of, of course, it would be in an imperial prison. Naturally, it would be Andy Circus. So uh, <laughs> I, I couldn't imagine anybody better in that role. Yeah, he's he's a very good actor, out, even outside of the motion capture stuff that he's done and voice stuff that he's done. Like you say, I definitely agree with that. And then I got to admit, I did not realize this the first time I saw the episode I didn't make the connection until I was looking at the credits later on, but there is another character from Rogue One who's in the prison with Cassian. His name is Melshi, the character, played by the actor Duncan Powell. He becomes one of the soldiers that goes to Scarif at the end of Rogue Ooh. One with Andor. Uh, I did not make that connection as big of a Star Wars fan as I am. Did you, uh, did you guys uh, realize this at all? Rebecca, did that... Oh, no. No. no, definitely, definitely nope. not me. Okay. <laughs> so that's a cool connection. I, I got to say, the fact that they're setting that up for them to become acquaintances and then friends and then fellow rebel soldiers later on in the timeline is cool. We got some more connections to Rogue One as well here in the character of Benthic Two Tubes, who's that weird alien-looking guy with the tubes coming down from his mask or face, played by mm -hmm. Aiden Cook, who's a character performer. And then, of course, uh, like I mentioned earlier, Forrest Whitaker is back as Saw Gerrera. And I've called him the uh, the Fat Tony of the Star Wars universe. If you're a, a Simpsons fan, <laughs> you know that uh, Joe, Joe Mantegna, the actor, has said, you know, anytime you need the character of Fat Tony, who's the mob boss on The Simpsons, he's willing to show up and record the lines for that. And I feel like Forrest Whitaker is the same way because um, he has done the... Jedi Fallen Order video game. He was in Star Wars Rebels as Saw Gerrera, and now he's back again after Rogue One. He's coming back for Andor as well. Uh, Geo says, I didn't make that connection until I looked at the mug of coffee I was drinking. Rogue One mug while watching yesterday morning. All right. <laughs> was his face on the mug? I guess so. I'm guessing. <laughs> he was like, oh, hey, wait, that guy's on my TV right now. <laughs> Do you guys think that We'll see more of Saw Gerrera this season on Andor, or is this going to be it? He's just going to turn down Luthen's offer and be gone, or is he going to come back for more? I, I think he's coming back for more. He didn't have the oxygen, uh, and right. he didn't see his legs either. So, right. so something is going to happen. I'm, I'm betting he comes back. Something goes wrong. He gets hurt, and that's where he he fractures with the rebellion and and goes off on his own and. And doesn't want to be a, a part of it. I, I hope we get more Forrest Whitaker. He's awesome. I would love more Saw Gerrera uh, in the show and and see more of Forrest on the screen. So, God, yeah. I hope so. Yeah, me too. I do hope we get to see more of him because they put him on the poster. You know, I I see the billboard when I'm driving uh, to Hollywood, and he's on the po he's not going to be on the poster if he's only in, like part of one episode, right? I really yeah. hope that. They're not well, maybe being, it's uh, part of the contract. It's like, I yeah. want to be on the billboard. <laughs> I sure hope. So. I sure hope that's the case. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the stuff that's happening on the planet Ferrix, which is um, Cassian's like adoptive home planet, because his adopted mother, Marva Andor, she's having some troubles. She got injured. She's trying to be like a rebel in her own ways, whatever she can do. She was like searching for these hidden tunnels under the hotel where the Empire has set up their headquarters and Bix Colleen played by Adria Arjona and um, her friend Brasso played by Joplin Centaine. They're like looking after her in Cassian's absence. Um, and then you've got the characters of Vel Sartha and Sintakaz who are working for Luth and Rail are watching over Cassian's home, trying to find him because they've been tasked with 
eliminating him basically so that his knowledge of the operation and Luthen's identity uh, can't get out there. Are you, were you guys surprised that Luthen actually wants Cass, Cassian dead? Because I, I kind of got the impression earlier on that he wanted Cassian like long term in the re rebellion, not just for this one heist. And then it's just over and done with. I don't know. What were your thoughts on that, Rebecca? I think this is paranoia sneaking in. Yeah. I think this is what happens when you start to feel the the tightening hand, as it were. Um, that that's how I took it was um, that he felt like, oh wait, I don't know that guy as well as I thought I I thought I did. Now I'm kind of can I really trust him now that I know that that they're that they're kind of you know looking for me that that I'm I'm yeah. more more exposed. You know, there's that paranoia. You gotta you know get rid of those loose ends. That right. that was kind of because I agree with you that initially it felt like an investment in a in a resource. So yeah, that that's kind of yeah. how I processed it. Well, we'll see how that progresses. The other thing I was wondering about, I, I saw Alex mention this on Star Wars Explained as well, but the fact that um, Dedra Miro, this central character in the ISB, we've kind of been rooting for her to succeed <laughs> up to this point, and then now she finally gets to the point where she's like torturing our protagonist characters and we have to flip that switch in our brain like oh she's a villain like we have to kind of remind <laughs> ourselves of that how did you feel about that bill like have you I, been have you found yourself rooting for that character until this moment yeah yeah i have and and i guess maybe she's the best of the worst right you know they're if they're all terrible people and they're all right. out to oppress and and crush any sort of dissent and and, you know, she kind of stands out because she's fighting with those people. But, yeah, she's bad. And and I felt, it was like like you mentioned there, Mike, I, I felt, oh, oh, I shouldn't be rooting for her. Like, yeah. I, I don't, I shouldn't feel any empathy for her. She She's bad and she's going to hurt some innocent people. Yeah, all, absolutely. All, and she's only like, what, a lieutenant? Like, it's not even like she's an admiral. Like, Wait, imagine that's... if she got real power. <laughs> Exactly. Well, I think that's exactly it, because she was presented as this underdog in the Imperial Security Bureau and had all these people second guessing her and kind of shooing her away and giving her these like menial tasks. And she finally like earned the respect of the supervisors after all this uh, investigating. And she's very good at her job. And you're kind of on her side in those moments. And then you realize, oh, She's working for the bad guys and she's willing to do very bad things yeah. for them. So now we have to kind of readjust our perspective, I think, of, of that character going forward. How about, uh, was there anything else you guys wanted to mention about this episode specifically? Any favorite moments or scenes or, or even things that we didn't care about, didn't care for in this uh, installment? Either of you? Rebecca? Um. Well, it's funny. I think the conversation you guys were just having is part of the reason why I like this episode. Okay. Um, because I, I think I, I told you, I, I think earlier on when we were discussing the episodes, I told you part of my frustration was that I felt like they were wanting me to have empathy and cheer for individuals. Yeah. I just would would refuse to, to do so. And so I felt this like pulling on me by the creatives versus how I, no, I'm not going to cheer for her. You want me to, but I'm not going to. <laughs> and so I felt like, well, now I can just be like, yeah, I don't want to cheer for you. Right. So, so that was, so yeah. Now, now like, everybody's on the page that you were right? on five episodes ago. <laughs> so like, okay, cool. Now I can just, re I can relax. I stop having to be on guard for you trying to convince me I should cheer for this person. Oh, so I think that's part of what I liked about it. But the other, the other element was, I really liked that speech by Saw Guerrera. Yeah. Because I think it really points to the messiness of, of rebellion, the messiness of when you have an entity that is trying to squash, and then you have all these little segments that are being squashed by it, and how different they are all going to be, and how you're going to end up in some way kind of trying to defeat that power by maybe teaming with individuals that you don't particularly associate with, or they have elements of who they are that you wouldn't in any other time work with. But yeah. because of that kind of greater dynamic you're dealing with, you're kind of forced into those scenarios. And so I really, like I say, that moment felt just so tangible, so real. And his deliverance of that speech and just everything about that moment, I just really enjoyed. It, there's a little bit more weight to it, too, because we do know that 
Saw Gerrera never joins the Rebel Alliance, that he's always going to be this own little uh, rebel cell, this extremist cell, until the day he dies on Jedha in, in Rogue One. Spoilers, sorry, if you haven't seen that <laughs> film. Um, but yeah, he is kind of choosing to stick to his own path there and not, you, you know, like you were saying, the enemy of my enemy is my friend and we should exactly like Luthen is saying, we all need to band together or we're not going to achieve whatever yeah. the success. Yeah, you have these three individuals, right? You have Mon yeah. Mothma, you have Sagarera, and you have Luthen. And they're all kind of the similar goal, but each one is is parsing the information and dealing with the dynamics in very different ways. And I just found, I find that so compelling. Well, and, and I think one of the things that I, I particularly like about Andor is that, that those compelling moments are, are real moments. And it's not it's not about the Millennium Falcon being caught in a cave where they might be eaten up by a space monster. It's, it's like, oh, this is, this is real world geopolitical concerns of, well, I'm a senator. If they find me, yeah. they're going to execute me. And, and Saw Gerrera, well, why would I want to join with him? I've got my own cave here. We're, we're doing our thing. I don't like him. He hates me. Uh, I'm not going to help him out. And, and the idea that, you know, we were introduced to the Star Wars world where, you know, Obi-Wan Kenobi recruits Luke and they go off to the Death Star and he blows it up with a lucky shot. And and now we go back to, well, that's awesome and that does happen. But here's the the grounded, centered story of, you know, how how does this become real? And you you connect the historical moments of, and Lucas talked about this many times about how he connected this to issues with Vietnam and, and, and other uh, political issues of the day, uh, you know, that overpowering desire to crush anyone who opposes us. Well, here we get to see how, how they fight back. Yeah. Well, and the realization that Luthen in essence put these wheels in motion because he knew it would bring this response, this tyrannical response that would then cause people to make a choice. And that's just the notion of that. I mean, cause that has a tremendous cost and he's, he's playing with other people's lives. And it's just, it's, an, it, it's so like, just so, so fascinating, like just as a study and kind of humanity. And, and I, I'm, uh, yeah, it's very interesting. It's that, it's that sacrifice of I'm going to play with their lives and possibly get people killed, but it's going to force the majority who have sat on the side and just said, well, if I don't get involved, they won't harm me and everything's okay. It's going to force those people to realize, yeah, no, we, we can't live like this. We have to. We have to work together. Yeah, it's compelling. Did you have any final uh, scenes or moments you wanted to point out, Bill? Any other last observations about this particular episode? Holy moly, how quick and how much electricity went through that body of that prisoner. Like, like he was dead instantly. Oh, like, yeah, yeah. Like, wow. That, oh, wow. That's, that's. Yeah, and, and you know what? I really liked it too. That that despondency of, you know, I can I can get out of this. Yeah. All I have to do is just step on the floor. Um, yeah. And that's that's that real world connection there. I can't say much about the. I, I, like I said, I've seen the next two episodes. I'm not allowed to say anything about it. But get ready for more of that kind of stuff. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, I I did want to observe that I really like. Uh, as despicable of a character he is because we we saw in this episode that Cyril Karn is so willing and ready to become a fascist which I predicted a while ago that he's like oh I can't wait to be a fascist so quickly um but we did see him wearing this great suit, like Star Wars suit there yeah, I like that you had it ready to go I was like oh I really want that suit and tie combo I want them to sell it at Galaxy's Edge it's very Star Wars while also being like semi formal in, in the real world fashion. Um, but yeah, they got to start uh, selling those either on the Galactic Star Cruiser or or wherever. Um, but yeah, uh, I uh, am looking forward to chatting more with you guys about uh, further episodes. But uh, speaking of further episodes, Bill, what are your hopes and expectations for the rest of this season of Andor, I think we've got four left to go after this. Uh, K2SO, 
dear God, bring him in. I know we <laughs> saw that that uh, the row the the droid there before. Yeah, I, I wanna I wanna see Alan hear Alan Tudyk's voice. Uh, uh, we need zero. some comic comic relief well, in this do. show. Yeah, this is pretty serious. <laughs> Come on, put a put a joke or two in here. Um, I like Cyril too, and yeah, I. I can't wait i think it's more not so much about him wanting to be a fascist i think he's just so angry that he was the best at his job and he got beaten by andor and he's just he's out for revenge um but yeah i'm looking forward to that and hopefully we'll we'll get to see uh k2so in there and uh and more soccer era good stuff what about you rebecca anything that uh this episode inspired in you to want to see more of in and yeah more bix more Bix. Oh, I think we'll get that for sure. Yep, I want I more so. Bix. So this gave right. me hope that I will have more Bix. I was beginning to lose hope, but no, there there is hope. Yeah, we keep checking back in on those folks hanging out on Ferrex, and we get to see this guy again, P two Emo or wherever P two nice. Emo. Yeah. yeah. So, so that's my that's my that's my dream. Excellent. That's going to wrap up our discussion of this week's episode of Andor and bring us to our final segment here on Who's the Boss. It's called First Steps into a Larger World. This is where we talk about the media we've been consuming and or enjoying outside of Star Wars. I have a great one this week. I went to one of my favorite, actually probably my favorite immersive theater events that happens usually every Halloween season here in Southern California. It's called Delusion. I think I talked about it last year when I did it and we went back and did it again. I think this is my fifth time doing a a different show of Delusion. So each season, each year, they'll do an entirely different show. But this was the first one that actually took place in the same venue as the previous year. So they had the same house. It was out there in, I think it was in Pasadena or Pomona, one of those places out uh, east of L.A. And uh, excellent, excellent. Again, I have never walked away from delusion disappointed. It's a little pricey. It's uh, I think it's hundred and something dollars a ticket, but uh, well, well worth it. If you like immersive theater, if you like scary Halloween type stuff, I always highly recommend that. So go and check that out. It's at I think that website is enterdelusion.com. So you can visit that and learn more. How about you, Bill? Anything you've been reading, watching, uh, playing lately that you've enjoyed? Uh, Alaska Daily with uh, Hilary okay. Swank on, on ABC has is, is been fantastic. Uh, season two of the Mysterious Benedict Society has, right. has come back. And oh, I, I love the first season. And I've seen the first three episodes. And it's, it's just it picks up and just keeps the ball rolling. And I just read, and I'm a big food guy, uh, <laughs> I, I love the history of food, and I especially love the show on the History Channel, The Food That Built America. Uh-huh. I just read a book about famous Nathan's hot dog stand in uh, Coney Island, and uh, I'm I'm jonesing for a hot dog from Nathan's right now. It's the history of the stand and and Nathan himself and setting it up. It's just a fantastic tale. So awesome! Oh, that sounds right up my alley. I'd like to to learn more about that. How about you, Rebecca? I know you were busy on your trip, but did you? consume anything on the plane or anything maybe <laughs> actually i've uh i've dived into the world of doctor who oh yeah um, so this is brand new for me um i tried it back in college and couldn't stomach it um but uh over the weekend i was sick in bed and i was looking for something that i could binge and so i was like yeah i'll so i started with 2005 so what's the current season one so that would be okay. christopher eccleston and i'm just now meeting um, the doctor that everyone always talks about, who is also a voice in DuckTales, David Tennant. David Tennant. Oh, now so, it's... so that is that is where I am now. And I'm enjoying it. Very excited <laughs> about the announcement that it will be coming to Disney Plus yeah. um, in, in the future. But in addition to that, if you did not see the premiere of Wakanda, the red carpet, actually purple carpet, the fashions on this carpet were tremendous. Mm. The women were just amazing and the men were stunning. And there was, you, oftentimes there's like, oh, what were they thinking, you know, of, as I watched like, you know, Hollywood fashion, but I did not find any of them. Some of them are more out there than would be my taste, but each person just did an exquisite job of picking something yeah. stunning. It was, oh, it was beautiful fashion on, on, on display at that, at that red carpet, purple carpet. So I loved it. 
Yeah, looking forward to seeing uh, Black Panther, Wakanda Forever, for sure. I have a couple questions about Doctor Who, though. I, I feel like I know, like, next to nothing about this show. I see. I think I've seen one episode ever. Okay. And obviously, I know, okay, there was Doctor Who in the, when did it start? In the 60s? Yes. Okay, and it went for a few decades, and it stopped, and it came back. Yes. And it had, like, I think Christopher Eccleston was on The Leftovers, right? Is he one of the uh, actors on that show? Anyway, oh, wow. um David Tennant and Matt, Matt Smith, right? But yep. um, so now I heard, maybe this is getting into spoilers or whatever. But it is, is Matt, it's is, spoilers, Doctor Who oh, spoilers. So should I not say anything? I have not seen a single episode. Okay. Well, I heard it's David Tennant, is, is David Tennant coming back as Doctor Who? Okay. Yeah, yeah. It was a, it was a big teaser over the weekend. the The current Doctor uh, is fading away, and uh, David Tennant will be coming in for a short run, and okay. then and then there will be a, another another Doctor um, coming after 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 that. So so it's a very exciting time within that Doctor Who world. But I am so fresh and so new. I am the wrong person to be talking at all about that because, like I say, just 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 binge watched a little bit, you know, kind of over the weekend, just getting my toe in the water. Luke Manning, however, uh, yeah. right here at Laughing Place is a like diehard Doctor Who fan. He's written articles for us previously about the some of the Disney references in Doctor Who. Like one of the ones I was watching of all things, they started reciting the lyrics of um, Circle of Life. Um, <laughs> and so it was it was very funny. But um, so so he is super excited uh, about the arrival on um, Disney uh, Plus here in the U.S. Uh, in 2023. So if you have questions about it, I would say find Luke Manning at Laughing Place. And he is your go to source for Doctor Who, much in the way that when I have questions about Star Wars, I knock on the door <laughs> of Mike Celestino. And sometimes I'm even able to answer them. That um, most of the time. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I Doctor Who is one of those things I've always felt like I should be into. But every time I try, it just doesn't catch for me. It doesn't stick for me for yeah. some reason. Same with Harry Potter. Like, I've seen the movies, but I can't, I don't know, I can't get into the books. Uh, I know people swear by them. I don't know. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm just too old to start something new and and that expansive like that because I feel like those are two b very big uh, universes. But yes, they are. Uh, yeah, excited for you coming uh, with Doctor Who coming to Disney Plus for sure. So that's pretty cool. Uh, that's going to bring us to the end of this week's episode of Who's the Boss. I want to thank my guest this week, Bill Gausel. Bill, uh, where can people go to find? Well, people will go to Laughing Place, right? To find yeah. your, your go writing. Go to Laughing Place, laughingplace.com. Uh, recaps for Alaska Daily and yeah. Mysterious Benedict Society, uh, Wednesdays and Thursdays. And uh, Touchstone and Beyond usually gets put out on, on Sunday. And uh, uh, this week, you'll get to hear me rant about uh, the Cold Creek Manor and how it could have been so much better because it had such a great cast. <laughs> um, yeah, and then the week after is because the election's coming up. Yeah, uh, there's there's a client. It's Touchstone and Hollywood Pictures, so I'm uh, I'm reviewing Nixon with Anthony oh, Hopkins. So. Oliver Stone's Nixon. Uh, oh yeah, there's there's <laughs> there's so so much to say there. I, so uh, Bill, after you watch Nixon, you should go on YouTube and look for a, a sketch from the Dana Carvey show. I think it's called Oliver Stone's George Washington. Um, and maybe even embedded in your in your <laughs> review. It was in it aired the, on uh, ABC, which would have been, I don't know if it was Disney owned at the time. When did Disney buy ABC, Rebecca? Was that like that was the, the I 90s, am not right? Benji. <laughs> <laughs> but uh yeah, hilarious, hilarious sketch. That's a parody of the uh, Oliver of Nixon. Stone's Nixon. All yeah. right. I'll check it All out. All right. <laughs> so uh Rebecca, what about barely necessities? What are you guys doing on there lately? Oh, holiday season is holidays, approaching. So yeah. Disney is day. There's a deluge of merchandise coming at us all the time. So uh, be sure to uh, stop by Barely Necessities. That airs on Tuesdays. But I want to let everybody know that here at Laughing Place, we've launched something new. It's a 24 hour a day uh, news yeah. and information uh, site. It's laughingplace.com slash TV. Some of you might actually be watching this there because what we do is we read broadcast our live in-studio shows there. But most of the time, what you find there are the latest headlines, some uh, park information like current queue weights because we know Disney fans look at that when they're not in the parks. 
along with the weather at the parks and other fun little word puzzles and stuff like that. So something you can have on in the background. Think of it as, you know, like what, uh, you know, when you're in the airport and you've got that weather TV going on, it's like that, but it's all Disney news all the time. Laughingplace.com slash TV. Be sure and, and stop by, give it a look. Great. And thank you again for uh, guest co-hosting this week, of course. And we'll be back next week with uh, more discussion of Star Wars and or with episode nine coming to Disney+. Plus. As always, like I said earlier, please visit LaffyPlace.com for all your Disney news and opinions. And follow Who's the Boss on Twitter at Who's the Boss Pod, where we talk about all things Star Wars and pop culture and Lucasfilm. My name is Mike Celestino. Thank you so much out there for listening. See you next time. Thanks. Bye. Bye, everyone.